So we're going to talk to you uh, about a game we made in Tune, which is a game about navigating consent. And we're going to talk to you about the discourse around consent and why I guess these sorts of projects are important and how we can bring this discourse to other projects. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Allison. Uh, I have a bit of a music background, I guess you would say. Um, and I used to work at a queer youth charity, which is where I got my uh, interest in video games, because I was looking for media that represented these youth that they could consume that wasn't Degrassi, because I'm Canadian, and that's what we do. Um, and I have no formal training in video games and programming or art, but I have love for making them. Uh, so, my name is uh, Jess, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm recovering from strep throat. So, uh, it takes me a lot of air, and I'll have to take a lot of pauses sometimes. Uh, so, uh, I have a background in creative writing and arts. Uh, I also have no formal training. I like to say that I made my first game by accident a few years ago, uh, when I was covering Global Game Jam as a journalist. Um, so, since I first learned to make games as a jammer, I've learned to do a little bit of everything as needed, but I also have no formal training. And I'm Zach Miller. I'm a DIYer, programmer, slash musician, and I come from Saskatchewan. I um, moved to Montreal about a year and a half ago, during which time I've sort of been worming my way into the Montreal game scene and doing an okay job of it, I find so far. So you might be wondering, uh, although you're probably not, about uh, how the three of us who have you know, so little formal training and with such varied backgrounds uh, came together to make a game. And actually, if it weren't for the Montreal game scene, uh, the, I guess the game making culture in Montreal, we might never have made a game. Um, we try not to think about that darkest timeline. But we do want to acknowledge that culture and the context that we came from. One of the great things that Montreal has is an alternative game community. And uh, that's based a lot in the Mount Royal Game Society. They have meetings at least twice a month to foster the making of alternative games. It's a community where you can meet other people with the same interests as you, hobbyists or professionals, and uh, go there to develop your skills and meet new people. There's actually a really great regular there who goes around uh, telling everybody to make games and introducing them with a secret handshake that he's never taught them. Uh, which is one of my favorite things. And we could teach you that handshake, but then we would have to kill you. Uh, another initiative in Montreal that's very close to my heart is the Pixels Incubator. Uh, it's a six-week uh, self-taught game incubator that encourages those who self-identify as women to become first-time solo game makers. Uh, this is the Pixels' third year, and the organization also offers free workshops all year, as well as pairing up women in the game industry with women who want to join the industry for mentoring. And I actually made my first solo game through the incubator uh, with their follow-along program, uh, which I'm entering for this year. We also have access to Montreal in a bunch of post-secondary institutions, which is amazing. Uh, the one that we are most intimately associated with is uh, Concordia. And Concordia actually has a plethora of game labs. Uh, one of them is the Technoculture Arts and Gaming Lab. They host workshops throughout the year, and they are free workshops to develop game-making abilities in people who want to learn. They also do Critical Hit Incubator over the summer, which some of you may have heard of because we have some people from NYU there. Uh, they also do Gamerella, which is really important to me, which is a game jam that's focused on women and first-time game makers acquiring the skills and making games, uh, along with a whole bunch of other game jams over the course of the year. And I actually made my first solo game using these resources. Um, there's also the M Lab, which is Mia Consalvo's Game Studies Lab, which hosted the jam at which Intune was made. So if it weren't for all of these accessible opportunities we've had in Montreal, we may never have even gotten to making games together. So we are all three of us, self-taught game makers without a great deal of actual game making experience or formal training, and yet here we are making games. So, Intune. Intune is a game about navigating consent. It's facilitated by controllers, which allow people to mechanically indicate their consent, their willingness to continue negotiating, their comfort, and also detect when players are making skin-to-skin -skin contact. So at uh, this point, Allison is going to read the rules of the game here, while Jess and I uh, sort of act out how the game would normally be played. So this will give you an, a bit of an idea of what the game looks like and how it works. Um, and I'm going to read the rules for you because we spent a lot of time carefully crafting and writing these rules. 
so that the language is just right. And so I'm going to read from the page so we don't get any of them wrong. So this game will involve physical contact with your partner is an important part of the experience. This physical contact will be reached after careful consideration and communication. When you begin to play, an image will appear on screen. You'll be asked to recreate the on-screen physicality with your partner. You and your partner can discuss how, when, and if you feel comfortable with the experience presented to you. There is no time restraint on this discussion. During the experience, you can share how comfortable you are by squeezing the controller. You can indicate consent mechanically. We encourage you also to communicate this to your partner verbally. Know that you can revoke consent at any moment. This does not end the game or skip the pose. It just ends physical contact and continues the negotiation. This act of revoking consent will give all participants an audio cue. No physical contact should occur while there is not consent. It is important to know that you, have, you can have varying levels of comfort while still consenting, as long as you feel respected and most importantly safe. Once you and your partner have discussed your personal limitations and boundaries, there are two ways to proceed. If you and or your partner are not comfortable with the suggested action, you may skip the pose. Or you can come to an agreement and hold the indicated pose, as I guess they're about to do, for 15 seconds. Either of these actions will continue the game. You will then be asked to discuss the experience. There is no time limitation on this discussion. The game is over when one or both players decide it is. At this point, the game ends. You can end the game at any time if you feel unsafe. This is not part of the negotiation. So I know they've been rehearsing their jokes for like a week for this. <laughs> so they're really excited. They refuse to tell each other beforehand too. Sorry. <laughs> you will then be asked to discuss the experience. There's no time limitation on this discussion. Uh, you can end the game at any time if you feel unsafe. This is not part of the negotiation, and you do not need your partner's permission. Consent is not a static or stagnant thing. It is a continuing negotiation of comfort levels and boundaries. It is not a single action. It is a continuing negotiation of actions. It can evolve, can be revoked, and can never be taken from you. Remember to check in with your partner vocally and frequently. Let your partner know how you are feeling and ask how they are feeling. Make sure that your partner not only feels safe and secure moving forward with you, but even more importantly, and possibly most importantly, that they feel safe and secure saying no. Consenting to an action does not mean you have to consent to that action in the future, or that you cannot revoke consent. Conversely, not consenting to an action does not mean that it is permanently off the table. Renegotiating your boundaries when you feel secure and comfortable is an integral part of navigating consent with a trusted partner. This does not mean it is okay to pressure someone into consent consenting by relentless requests, only that it is possible in a respectful relationship to renegotiate how and when you feel comfortable. Ask for permission continuously. Try, are you comfortable? Does this feel good? And what would you like me to do? So those are the rules that we always, or we try always to present with our game, and kind of how it would go down. Uh, in a real play scenario. Uh, so as you might think, a game like this that is about consent does have the potential to make people uncomfortable and if not treated with the proper respect, uh, feel very unsafe. So first of all, we only present in tune uh, in venues that have a safe space policy or its equivalent. Uh, we always print physical copies of the policy and keep them on hand in a visible space near the game. Uh, we use this as an opportunity to let players know that there is a system in place if they do feel unsafe, but also to raise awareness for the existence of safe space policies. Uh, we often present the rules in a public fashion, sort of as we just did, where some, one of us will present them to everyone present. Uh, however, if somebody is not present at that point and wants to play, we have this lovely rule book here that we make, so they can read through that and get all the rules that way as well. The embarrassing pictures of us at cottages. <laughs> uh, so another thing we do is we always uh, have someone accompany the game, so it's more like an installation game. And we have someone wait with people who are in line to play the game uh, for a lot of reasons, to deal with mechanical questions they have about how the controllers work, concerns about the theme of the game, to make sure that everyone who plays has heard the rules or read the rules and understands what the game entails and what sorts of consent they'll be dealing with. Um, it also gives people who come a person to play with if they don't want to play with the people they've come with or if they've come alone. Then someone else has to take over the questions, though. 
Uh, and in a worst case scenario, that, though it hasn't happened yet, having someone with the game at all times allows us to intervene if things look like they're going in a direction that uh, could possibly become unsafe. And uh, lastly, we have our lovely suggestion couch here. Um, if you may be one of the few people who don't know what a suggestion couch is, basically it's a couch that doubles as a suggestion box. So we ask that people leave feedback, whether positive or negative, so that we can continue to improve the experience for everyone. And also become aware of blind spots that we may have. Uh, you put feedback uh, between the couch cushions. Um, so making into a comfortable game to play is a continuing process, and we've not yet perfected it. One of the things we're actually dealing with right now is this game as a performance, because the dynamic of an audience and players isn't one that we had uh, intimately considered when we first made the game, and the venues that we've been presenting it in, when it kind of becomes an installation piece, have led to pressures and relationships that we didn't first think about. Uh, and a lot of the time, uh, the suggestion couch is the way that we come to realize these dynamics if we don't experience them ourselves. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put a suggestion in the couch yourself. We have uh, markers and an adorable notebook. Uh, so one of the questions we always get asked about this game is why make a game about consent? And that can be broken down into smaller questions. And the first one that we want to talk about, possibly the most important, is why consent? So our culture does not represent the navigation of consent frequently, or I would say not well, very often. Um, this BuzzFeed video, by the way, you should all watch it, which is uh, it's great, and I'm surprised at how wonderful BuzzFeed has been lately. But this BuzzFeed video is the only representation of navigation of consent that has naturally found its way into my life. Uh, that's like saying that I didn't seek it out because I'm making a game about consent, it found its way to me. And it says something about our culture that a BuzzFeed video is the best representation I have of the navigation of consent. Uh, one of the most obvious failings of the representation of consent uh, that often comes up is the lack of the navigation process. Uh, consent's often taken as implicit. Uh, picture all those classic romantic comedies where the man will like push the woman up against the wall and then um, often uh, he'll kiss her and sadly that's often to shut her up. Um, that sort of representation completely uh, skips over the navigation of consent and just takes it as something that is to be taken. Another more subtle way uh, that the representations of consent are problematic is the narrative of pursuing a yes, or having one person who's giving consent and uh, the other person who's asking for it. Often men are asked to make sure that they have a woman's consent, which is amazing, but the language used in these conversations frequently centers uh, the discourse around usually women being the ones withholding consent and men being the ones seeking it. Uh, this ignores consent as a two-way relationship, and it ignores the constantly shifting intricacies that are involved in true negotiations. We were very careful in making in tune to word the discussions of the game as negotiating or navigating consent, and not to speak in terms of giving and getting. One of the other problems that often comes up with the representation of consent is it's uh, usually presented as being binary. You either have consent or you don't. Uh, and it completely skips over the fact that it's, consent is very multifaceted and it's a, more of a continuum. Um, you can have consent for one thing, um, for one action or one type of interaction, but not for another. Uh, and that's often missed. So, um, our conversation up to this point has been discussing consent in ways that it is often traditionally discussed in relation to sex and very specific forms of intimacy. One of the important things we want to emphasize in our game is navigating consent outside of these very specific spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, these sort of spaces come up just around people daily, um, often without us even being aware of it. And you have to navigate these boundaries while choosing seats on public transit, while conversing on sensitive topics, and uh, while meeting new people, of course. Do you shake their hand? Do you give them a hug, kiss on each cheek? Um, these are just a few of the examples, probably some of which you've come across even today. And I actually want to say that earlier, just earlier today, we saw some people ask if they could give Frasca a hug, and we were so happy about that, because a lot of the times that's one of the interactions in daily life that people take for granted, like, you want my hugs. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so it's really important to us that, uh, that Intune isn't a sex or a romance game, and it's only an intimacy game so much as your interactions with all people are intimate interactions. Because we want to make sure that 
the navigation of consent isn't limited to the bedroom, and that it's something that you can take into every part of your life. So, why use this medium to deal with what is often seen as, as a difficult to approach and very serious topic? First and foremost, we want to move from a discussion of consent to a practice-based approach. During a consent workshop, for example, participants are uh, discussing what consent should look like and how to practice it, but they're not traditionally given the chance to actually make use of the skills that they're supposed to be learning. Uh, participants could be practicing by navigating consent with another person in a scenario that, while safe, still actually involves negotiating consent for real physical content. Uh, practicing negotiation of consent can hopefully lead to increased comfort with using those consent skills when the time actually comes. However, uh, there is a more systemic problem tied into this, the culture of the soft no. North Americans, and this trend probably extends much more broadly, are not comfortable saying no. Instead, we say maybe when we want to say no, or we give other excuses, or in some cases, even feel that we have to say yes to situations we don't feel comfortable with. Rarely are there spaces where we are given permission and are encouraged to say no. So at this point in time, of time here, we're going to have a little bit of fun, and we're going to do some improvisational comedy. <laughs> so, this goes for the uh, guys. <laughs> we're going to play a game here called Shoulda Said. What's going to happen is Jess and Allison are going to act out a scene, and then upon delivery of the last line of dialogue, we'll have a Shoulda Said pop up on screen, at which point you can all join me in saying Shoulda Said, and then a new line of dialogue will need to be delivered. So, three, two, one, cue scene. Uh, so, so Jess, how, how are you doing? Great, great, how are you? Uh, wonderful, I have a, an extra ticket to that Spice Girls reunion tour at coffee houses across the country. Oh, that sounds so much, like so much fun. And I, I know, and I was wondering if you could, uh, or if you wanted to come with me. Oh, um, what day is that? I think I have to water my cat. <laughs> Should have said. Um, oh, gee, you know, I'm really allergic to the combination of all the Spice Girls and coffee together. <laughs> Should have said. Um, by Canadian law, I'm not allowed to attend events uh, that have less than 30% Canadian content. <laughs> Should have said. Um, no thanks, Allison, but thank you very much for asking. Uh, so I just wanted to say that even in doing this like quick activity, we felt uncomfortable coming up with ways to say no in a way that didn't portray Jess as particularly bitchy or mean. We know that that's actually one of the problems that is coming up with Intune, and we want to acknowledge it, knowing that the difficulties will still be there, but hopefully that uh, at least by acknowledging it, we can be aware of them and people can make the people they're playing with more comfortable in saying no. Yeah, improvisational comedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, um, so yeah, consent skills are uh, rarely practiced, but even more rare is the chance to practice the kinds of consent that fall outside of the sexual intimacy negotiations that uh, consent is usually thought of in relation to. Uh, that's one area where we think that in tune can be particularly useful uh, because it uh, does deal with those other sorts of consent that um, often come up more frequently in our day-to-day -day lives. So it's changed how we ourselves think about consent um, just, you know, day to day. Also, by moving into the space that we play in TuneIn, players are moving into a space where they're asked to follow arbitrary rules. And a lot of the arbitrary rules that we have put in place are to make them consider physical actions that they're taking in a way they might not in outside spaces. So, our game in Tune has similar levels of physical contact to a game, say like Twister, for example. Uh, but what makes people think of Intune differently is precisely that that they're being asked to think differently, and consider the physical contact that they're taking part in. And so, lastly here, uh, we'd just like to go over some of the goals that we had when we originally set out to make this game. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to solve was that we wanted to have a game that would, um, would really show consent in a new way and that hadn't really been shown that much. Um, where we're looking to take into it in the future is we're looking to show it, um, one of the places that at least is to show it in schools. Uh, we think it would be really great for kids in elementary schools or in high schools even um, to see this game. Because uh, it's one of the few times that consent is taught in a non-sexual way, um, where kids are learning, you know, whether it's okay or not okay to touch like in recess and on the playground and such.
Uh, yeah, we also want to take it to university workshops and gender advocacy centers. Uh, like we said, to move from a discourse space to a practice space. So games are a medium that can bring this subject to new and more spaces of the average consent workshop. Uh, not that we're claiming that Intune specifically will reach all gamers everywhere, but game players represent an audience that may not have been exposed to consent discussions. This audience itself is exactly one of the new spaces we're hoping to reach with our game about consent. We want you to see it and to think critically about what consent is like in games. Also, up here are some of, uh, a bunch of other games that we've came across that, is, uh, that are two-player consent games because consent with a program or a machine is a kettle of fish we don't want to touch. And a lot of them are actually going to be here this weekend, and we really encourage you to play them, to think about how consent enters into your play of them, and just to take that discourse about consent, not, into these, not only into these games, which have a focus on consent, but into all the other games you play and the games you make. So, thank you.